Hi, this is Mike Brown, owner of Death Wish Coffee Company. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast. I love Java, Death Wish Coffee presents Fueled by Deathcast, the world's strongest podcast. With your hosts, the incredible Jeff and the amazing D Man. It's that time again. Oh boy. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast. As always, I am the Incredible Jeff. And I am the Amazing D-Man. Yay! <laughs> yes, you are. Welcome to episode 22. We're pretty excited about this one. Uh, as always, I want to thank Brock Powell, BrockVox.com. He's an incredible voice actor, and he's the voice behind all the voices you hear on this podcast, except for my own and D-Man's, hmm. and our guest. Um, I also want to take a second and uh, talk about some of our friends, our podcast friends out there. Uh, I love listening to podcasts because not only are podcasts fun to listen to, but I learn about other people's podcasts by listening to podcasts because we all are in a great community. Um, so I want to shout out Brock's uh, podcast, which is Unpop. Uh, entertainment where they uh, talk about unpopular opinions about movies and they're really hilarious. Uh, I want to shout out a uh, friend of Death Wish Coffee and friend with, a friend of us, Mr. Throwback Thursday. If you like hip hop, this is the podcast for you. Uh, Mr. Throwback Thursday also has a GoFundMe account going on right now to uh, upgrade some of their equipment so you can go help them out if you like what they're doing. Um, our new friends Broad Wasted podcast that we met down at New York City Podcast Festival. Those guys are really fun. Uh, and finally, um, brand new podcast. First little episode is up on Facebook. You can go check them out. They're called Unwarranted Advice. Really fun, really cool. Definitely go check those guys out. Stay tuned, everybody. You know, today is May 4th. One of, first of all, one of my favorite holidays, because yep. May the 4th be with you. Because you're a geek. Because I'm a geek. <laughs> um, and second of all, we've been teasing for an entire month that this is the episode that we're going to announce the winners of the one-of-a-kind decanters. Did I win, Jeff? No, you lost. But there are three people that won, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that later on in the episode. But we're going to start... Um, a contest just for this week. We're going to see how well it goes to, uh, you know, kind of give you guys something different. Uh, we're going to give away a free pound of coffee. And all you got to do is share this episode and use the hashtag fueled by deathcast. That's it. Or make just make a post and use the hashtag fueled by deathcast. As long as we see that hashtag, you've got a chance to win. And uh, we'll pick somebody for, and we'll announce it on next week's episode. And we'll give you a free pound of coffee. And this is great in in case you're a fan of the podcast but have yet to have tried the coffee. This is your chance to uh, give it a go. Or if you're a fan of the podcast and you love the coffee, here's just an extra bag for your cupboard. Secret code unlocked. Discount of death. So this week and this week only, and this ends May 10th, we're giving you a code that not only gives you a discount on the t-shirts, but it, it coincides with a giveaway that we're doing. Yeah. So these are American-made T-shirts that we're selling now. Made in the USA, baby. And in celebration, we're giving away a uh, a pencil. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk I think about it's a couple pencils. Oh, a couple pencils. Yeah. We'll talk about that later in the podcast. But if you use the code USA, oh yeah, three letters. Oh, I, yeah. spe I said it and spelt it at the same time. Yeah. Uh, that'll that'll give you four dollars off of uh, uh, the Death Wish American-made T-shirt. So, I mean, everybody I've ever seen looks great in these T-shirts. Just pick one up. We got four bucks off for you. Plus, you get a free gift. Yeah. Can't beat it. Rip the sleeves off. Look like a look like a yeah. crazy dude. Yeah, yeah. Do anything totally. you want. Four dollars off. USA. Ah, science. This week, D man, mm -hmm. we're not gonna go to space. We're gonna stay on Earth. Phew. Good, because there's no there's no air I can breathe in space. So. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, but this uh, was actually uh, came across some of the science journals this week, and I thought it was really interesting and something worth talking about. Um, there was a discovery of mastodon skeleton, and it actually is, we've discovered mastodon skeletons here and there, you know, that's not a big deal. But this is a big deal because it actually might upend everything we think we know about human evolution. Before we go any further, I don't really know the difference between a mastodon mm -hmm. and a woolly mammoth. Uh, you know what? I don't think there is. Now, okay. listeners out there, you might 
be like, no, Jeff, you are completely wrong because I don't have the information right in front That's of me. That's why we're coffee specialists. Yes. <laughs> um, but I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that they're the same thing. Um, anyway, this actually this site was first discovered in 1992. OK. And the archaeologists that found it, found the bones, thought something was a little up, but we really didn't have the tech to really carbon date and really kind of get in there and, and, and make the right assumptions. But now we do. And we have figured out that these bones date back to 130,000 years old, which isn't, it is around the time mastodons were around, you know, so that's not that surprising. This was found in San Diego, California. Um, but what is surprising is they were buried next to large stones that appear to have been used as hammers and anvils, and the bones themselves seem to have deliberate cuts on some of the jaw lines and also some of the, the, the vertebrae. Hmm. Now, prior to this, we believed, and it is widely known in the in the scientific community, that um, the first known traces of humans, of th- what we consider humans, was 14,000 years ago. So this literally rockets that back 115,000 years. Wow. So we're, we're not just saying, oh, humans might have been here 10 years earlier than we thought. We're, this is you know centuries and centuries eras. And eras yeah it is pretty significant that this is coming across and to the point where they're publishing it in a science journal now and and archaeologists across the border basically throwing their hands up and going the the data's there this is what it's saying wow so this is the first time that we're seeing this you know humans and tools that are this old uh, in the continent of North America so that be, that brings so many different questions why have we not found them to this point why these you know traces of humans to this point why have um what happened to them did they maybe migrate to North America, you know, 130,000 years ago and then migrate away? They tangoed with one Macedon and, and said, like, let's get the hell yeah, out of like, here. <laughs> maybe maybe that was it, you know? Um, it's, it's really, really interesting. But now it gives archaeologists new vigor to go looking for these clues, you know, in other places. Because there are hotbeds of fossils, you know, especially in the Midwest and uh, in, in North America. So um, it's just a matter of digging in the right spots really it's crazy so <clears throat> do you think we'll find more I in that so. area i i mean in that area no um, i mean we didn't even find human remains we just found macedon remains that were and then were, tools and then tools yeah and it's not like saber-toothed tigers were carving up woolly mammoths correct with, with spears correct you know? it's it it's uh it's pretty interesting and for anybody who is on the west coast uh the this whole find all the bones the stones that, that we believe are tools and all that stuff they are on display at the san diego natural history museum as of right now and they'll probably cool. be for you know usually museum um exhibits go for a while so they'll probably be there for a while so you know, go on over and check them out yourself. It's pretty neat. Wow. What fuels you? So this week, D-Man, we got to talk to a legendary rock star, uh, Richard Fortas. And he has played in a thousand bands, but he's currently playing in, a, uh, I think, a kind of a, a little known band. They're Guns N' Roses. I don't know. I if think I've heard, heard of them, of them before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, he had some really cool stuff to talk about. And one of the things that he said that really hit home with me was he loves to embrace a new challenge in life, whether it's music or life. But he was kind of talking about music. like, And that's why he's played not only rock and roll, but hip hop and mm-hmm. pop music and country. And mm-hmm. he likes to challenge himself. He likes to put himself out there. I think it's a good habit um to when you when you <clears throat> sense that there is a difficult thing to do in front of you to run towards it right with 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 no hesitance to like be good at the thing that you're awful at yeah and you know purposefully doing things that are difficult to do will make you incredibly successful in other ways i think so too i I mean you start building skill sets including being able to endure a practice that that you're not used to i mm -hmm. mean it 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 broadens your horizons it opens your mind but when you make your weaknesses your strengths yeah you become invulnerable yeah i mean you know Fear, overcoming fear of anything is half the battle you know that's why so many people don't do things 
in this lifetime that they might be great at because you're scared of it, you know? Yeah. And I, I'm, the, I'm the exact same way. There are things in this world I've never tried because I'm just too, you know, it, it, it seems terrifying. But if you push that boundary and you, and you kind of just break over that wall, you know, of, of that you're putting up and you really kind of embrace the challenge, who knows what could happen? You could fail. Yeah. You know, you totally you, could you're fail. You're definitely going to. Yes. I mean, that's part of it. I mean, every time you fail, you're learning. Right. So you're just getting smarter, you're getting better, you're getting stronger. Yeah. It's, it's the idea of don't allow a challenge to be a block. I feel like there's something in human nature to to when they when they start to do something and it and it and it doesn't go the way they expect it to just walk away from it. Just right. you know, screw this. I'll, right. I'll find something better to do. But I feel like if you make it your habit to recognize that when your when your brain pops that up and you're like this is difficult, let's let's do something else. That that's your brain procrastinating. Yeah. L- look past that. Yeah. Look through it and work through it and as soon as your brain starts thinking that, reprogram it to see that as something you should be rushing towards. Right. You, you said it the best, man. You know, make your weaknesses your strengths. I almost feel like it, when when you make that a habit, your weaknesses become the best thing that could ever happen to you because yeah. it makes you conscientious to be good at something. Mm-hmm. It's, it, but it's, it's a tough thing to really wrap your mind around, but if you work at it every day, you know, it, it becomes like anything, it becomes easier and you will start to, just like Richard Fortas, you'll start to embrace the challenges of life. And we'll all become the guitarist of Guns N' Roses. Awesome. Can't wait. Community shout out. I, you know, it's incredible working at Death Wish Coffee because you never know what's going to happen when you come into work in the morning. Yeah, it's. It's pretty roll of the dice of what kind of zoo you're going to be dealing with for the day. So I, we're shouting out Mike Daniel, and I'm not even sure if you're on social media. If you are, you know, throw us a, throw us a whistle, tag us or something. But uh, I'll give you a little story as to why we're shouting out Mike Daniel. A couple weeks ago, every Friday, tune in to Death Wish Coffee on Facebook because we do some fun Facebook Live stuff on Friday where we pit two employees together in a hilarious usually contest of of hilarity and and we figure out who the winner is well i like that i like that hilarious contest of hilarity there you go (laughs) you should name it that um uh so a couple weeks ago we did one where uh myself kane and thomas all played a game of pig and every time somebody um, missed a shot the uh the community at large that was watching this facebook live had to say what type of punishment we got and uh thomas had to put lipstick on at one point <laughs> I totally and missed uh, that. <laughs> um i got shot in the stomach with uh mike brown's incredible fully automatic nerf gun <laughs> and uh, it was really funny and uh that was the end of it well last week on thursday we all come to work and there are all these packages from Hasbro. And we're all like, why are these packages from Hasbro here? And again, if you follow Death Wish Coffee on Facebook, you might have seen the Facebook Live video of us unboxing all of these, which were an arsenal of Nerf guns. I mean, really, just like everything. Sidearms, shotguns, yeah. like everything. Yeah, and we found out that Mike Daniel was watching the Facebook Live and sent us all these guns, and that's so nice of you. Not only is it so nice of you, you you ensured that our entire Thursday not a lick of work got done at Death Wish Coffee <laughs> because as soon as we opened those guns, it devolved into an, an all-out office nerf, nerf war. And I think there was at least two other wars that day. Yeah, no, it, it kept on reoccurring. In fact, it was one big war with many battles. Yeah. So <laughs> just to um, bookend this story, now at everybody's desk are c- completely fully loaded and cocked nerf guns <laughs> at all times and we all have trigger fin- like like itchy right, trigger right, fingers right, right now we're at a ceasefire yeah but if there are shots fired oh my it's, god it's it's it's, uh, it's a war zone you just hear the and it, it you just i i it, my the hair on the back of my neck goes up it's so much it's so hilarious so much fun we're so. all afraid to like dig into it again <laughs> yeah because it's like it's not gonna be a short 
thing. It's no. going to be a long battle, and we're all going to get sweaty and crazy. Oh, my crazy. God. I was so sweat. I was so sore the next day because I was, I was like, hiding under desks and, like, maneuvering. I was like, My army favorite crawling part and, was when Thomas was like, get in the giant box, Dustin. Yeah, and, and you guys it, were a tank <laughs> yeah, on a skateboard. So we so, threw me in a giant box on top of a skateboard. Thomas wheeled me out into the middle of everybody, and I jumped out and shot everybody from the box. It, it, was, was, it was beautiful. So much fun. So, <laughs> so Mike Daniel, thank you so much yeah, for, a- for sending us all that stuff. And uh, community shout out goes out to you this week. Okay, you guys have waited long enough. You've waited long enough. I, I gotta say, thank you so much. We had so many entries, man. Over three thousand entries for this contest for the rare decanters, and it's just it. You guys, that meant you shared the podcast. You followed Deathwish Coffee on Twitter. You followed us on YouTube. You were interacting with the brand, with the podcast. That's exactly what we wanted to do from a contest like this. And it just really thank you all for for being a part of this. It really, really is awesome. But there can only be three winners. So look in your emails today, and we're going to notify those three winners of which decanter they won and send them right out to you. Thank you guys so much again, and we'll be doing more of these contests in the future. Congratulations, guys. Yeah, congratulations, guys. And again, thank you all for, you know, interacting with the entries and that was we're really just trying this new viral sweep um contest kind of stuff and it went really well um so we're definitely going to do more of these and give away some really cool prizes so you know keep listening to the podcast and we'll do another one very soon thanks a lot um last week on the last episode d-man you had just gotten back from the scaa and you were telling me how you learned how to professionally brew a a cup of aeropress Uh, it's much more than professional jeffrey okay i i learned this uh method from the aeropress champion now if you're an aeropress champion you have a gold aeropress like solid gold nah it's okay. plastic okay let's <laughs> be, be like, real here i, don't I really want to like make coffee out of gold but i mean do it okay uh, maybe i would have to i would have to try once it. yeah so anyways him and the the champion from the year before that um had a contest to to make the best coffee and i had a blind taste test and i Hands down, I thought, I mean, the world of difference between the two coffees, and it was the same type of coffee. Yeah. It was astounding. Um, but the one that I enjoyed thoroughly was from the champion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring his method to you. I'm going to share it to the world. Awesome. Um, hopefully, I, I don't butcher it, um, but you know, it'll be somewhat close. Okay. Okay. So, so, some, so how do we lucky. start off? So First, <clears> you need an AeroPress, obviously. Yeah. And... Um, he uses three filters, which surprised three. me. Okay. Um, and you take your three filters and you put them yeah, in the little cap. Yeah. And uh, so we take a little water, a little, okay. a little boiling water. Okay. And we're going to pour it through just a tiny bit through the filters just, just to make sure that the filters are clean and pure. And how hot is the water? Uh, we're going from 175 to 180 degrees. Okay. A little bit lower than a drip or anything else. Okay. It's just the way the AeroPress works. Yep. So... We just pour a little bit of coffee or a little bit of water. Yep, a little bit of water in your AeroPress, kind of like charging your mug. Kind of like charging your mug. And I'm going to charge the mug, too, okay. because okay. we want to keep the mug nice and hot so you don't get cold, nasty coffee. Ouch. Yeah, careful. That's boiling water. Yes. <laughs> don't get the boiling water on you because it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you charge your mug. You charge your AeroPress. Put the air press on top of the mug. All right, and we're gonna use the uh, the the brewing ratio that's given to you on the, the R- side of the right on the side of the death wish bag. It's right there for you guys. Right, hear me scoop this in, and uh, you try not to get coffee grinds on the air press lip because that um, compromises the seal of the air press. Okay. Of the plunger. Now, um, what kind of grind should we use? Now, usually with AeroPress, from what I've learned, you use a finer grind. But Mr. Champion himself actually used a uh, more of a drip style grind, which mm. is actually convenient because then you can just buy ground coffee and uh, and you can just put it right in your AeroPress. Okay, so that's easy. So boom, we're loaded up. Okay. We make sure our plunger is moistened. Okay, so again, you know, charge all your different pieces. You know, make sure you you got a little bit of water on everything. All right, and then I'm going to fill my AeroPress tube full of water, pretty much to the brim, Mm -hmm. and we're going to stir it, and we're going to get the plunger in there. So here we go. Pouring a little bit of water. 
ouch on myself. Mm-hmm. I'm bad at this. It's okay. That's why You're I'm not the good. champion. You're doing good. I just learned from the best. There we go. All right. So we filled it up there with water. And we stir it up. Okay. Nice and lightly. Try not to get any any on the top. And this all comes with an AeroPress, right? Like the yep. plunger, the stir, the whole, the filters, the whole yep. nine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the plunger at, a, at an angle as to not push any down. And I'm going to pull up on the plunger just a little bit to stop the water from draining. And this creates like a vacuum. Okay. So you kind of come in at, at an angle and then you create the seal by pulling it into the AeroPress and then pull or pushing it into the AeroPress a little bit and then pulling it up. I kind of angle it into the AeroPress. So I'm not actually pushing it down. So I'm not plunging any through. And then I get it in there and I pull it up just a tiny bit to stop it from pouring through. Okay. And we're going to let it brew for only 45 seconds. All right. Now I see the timer is going here. So we're good. And the reason why it's 45 seconds, there's different notes of flavor that are released in the coffee with brew time. Okay. So you start, he explained, I'm going to butcher this. You're going to get your sour flavors, your sweet flavors, and then you're going to get more into your bitter flavors as you huh. let it brew longer. So you only want it to brew for 45 seconds. So we're at the 45 second mark here. All right. And you plunge it through. Okay. Nice, nice and, and slow. Light. Yep. You don't need to muscle this through. These are so great for, you know, on the go coffee making. And you push it down right up until you hear the hiss. And I'll put the microphone up so you can hear the hiss. There it is. I heard it. No more. No No more. more. So as soon as it hisses, you stop. Yeah. Okay. And I know the way I was making it before, I was just pushing it down, getting all the juices out. But we want the most pure flavors of our coffee to exist in our cup. And uh, yeah, you know, if you push it down all the way, you get the the satisfaction of spitting out a dry coffee puck into your garbage. But this will make a little bit of a sloppy mess. Try not to burn your hands. Boom. And we add a little water to top off our 11-ounce cup. Now, if I didn't add water to it... It'd still be good. It would still be fine? It'd okay. be, still be delicious. Just uh, This kind of makes it last a little bit longer. makes more like a, a uh, cup of coffee that you would expect. So, Jeff, try that out. Let me All know right. how that is. Well, that's smooth. That is so nice. That is really good. And, you know, I've had AeroPress coffee before, actually from you, Dan, yeah. on the road... Yeah. And um, this is better. Yeah. Yeah. I I was surprised. And now that's the way I make my coffee every morning now. And it's, dude, it comes out so much better. That's That's the way I, that's the way I make my death proof coffee too. I'm going to keep this cup of coffee. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Throw the other one away. Because it's really delicious. So yeah, that's how you make AeroPress like a champion. That is awesome. Pretty simple. So the three filters, you know, uh, we're not doing an inverted technique. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody make it upside down. Oh. People do that so you can keep the water and it doesn't leak out of the cup. Gotcha. But we we make up for that by doing uh, pulling up on the plunger a little bit when right. we put it in. Um, and you're only losing like just a little bit of water. So you get that full brewed cup of coffee. Well, there you go. Now you can all be pros at AeroPress Coffee. You're welcome. The Death Wish Death List. This past week, we lost a legendary film director, Jonathan Demme. He was 73 years old. He got his start uh, working for Roger Corman. And if you don't know who Roger Corman is, he is basically the champion of independent filmmaking. He is He made, I think, something like 800 movies. Wow. Yeah, like all the the B movies from the 70s and 80s like that was Roger Corman and 60s. Um, so Demi started working for him and he started writing and directed films like uh, Caged Heat and Fighting Mad. Um, and he directed a movie called Melvin and Howard that actually garnered enough critical acclaim that he directed uh, his first major motion picture called Swing Shift um, that starred uh, Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell in 1984. Uh, also in 1984, he directed Stop Making Sense, which is the concert film of the Talking Heads, and it's widely considered one of the best concert films in existence. And um, he had actually won the National Society of Film Critics Award for the best documentary. I love that movie. Um, other films he did during that period were Something Wild and Married to the Mob. And then in 1991, he hit gold and he directed 
Silence of the Lambs. And that movie is still only one of only three movies ever that swept all major awards. That's Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay, Best Actor, and Best there Actress. There was no movie like that when it came nope. out. The only other two movies to do that were It Happened One Night, the 1934 movie, and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. What, what kind of movies were they making in 1934? Right, you know? exactly. <laughs> um after Silence of the Lambs, uh, Demi was inspired by his friend, his close friend's battle with uh, AIDS, and he used his influence, his Oscar influence, basically, to push through uh, getting the movie Philadelphia made. He directed that movie, obviously starring Tom Hanks. It was one of the first major motion pictures to deal with the epidemic of AIDS. Tom Hanks won an Oscar for that, and he, uh, Demi, also directed the Bruce Springsteen uh, music video that went along with the title track of that of wow. that that movie. Other films that he did uh, later on were Rachel Getting Married and The Manchurian Candidate. His final work has yet to be released. It's actually a documentary on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it's due out later this year. Cool. I can't wait to yeah. see that. Um, he's uh, Finally, Demi was known, actually, for his dramatic close-ups. Um, if, again, go back to Silence of the Lambs and think of the famous quid pro quo scene and it's the just right on the characters and many many directors have um paid homage to demi including wes anderson most of wes anderson's work when you see him go to a close-up it it is directly an homage to demi's work oh, that's cool um i death wish you happy a birthday though this week to uh thursday the day this comes out may the 4th uh will arnett possibly my new favorite Batman because he's Lego Batman, but oh. also Arrested Development and a thousand other things yeah. that he's been a part of. Dude is hilarious. Bojack Horseman. Yeah, he's going to be 47. On Saturday, May 6th, the incredible Adrian Palicki. Uh, she's going to be 34. You might know her from Friday Night Lights. I know her from uh, portraying Bobby Morris on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. She of was also in the G.I. Joe movie. Uh, Sunday, May 7th, Aidy Bryant, one of the funniest women on Saturday Night Live today. She's going to turn the big 3-0. Um, and then finally, Wednesday, May 10th, Ellen Ochoa. Uh, she's going to be 59. She was the first Hispanic woman in space, and she is the former director of the Johnson Space Center. So happy birthday to all of them. And uh, we're going to take a short break and give you some awesome news from Death Wish Coffee. Man's Death Wish Update, brought to you by Death Wish Coffee. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. What do we got, D-Man? Too much coffee, that's what we have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, currently, right now, um, we are giving away free pencils with any American t-shirt purchase order. And they're pretty rad, they're part of our Grind It Out campaign, and they're Carpenter's pencils. Yeah. Like, so it's not just, you know, a little, you know, number two pencil or whatever. This, yeah, it's a big, are... thick pencil. In fact, we were we were uh, doing some stuff in the studio today. We were putting together some cabinets and hanging up some curtains, and I was using my new carpenter's pencil to mark the wall. <laughs> They're really cool. So you're going to get a you're going to get a couple of those um, with your T-shirt purchase. And those are celebrating now the fact that we, we're, we're getting our, our T-shirts made in America. So the, the shirts are made in America, then sent to our our um, apparel company, yep. Contemporary Design. So they're being printed right down the road. We're keeping everything done within our own boundaries. Yeah, that's really, really cool. And if you listen to the top half of this episode, there is a, a fun little secret code for those T-shirts too. So go back and hear that if you, if you missed it's it. It's USA. You get $4 off. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> so also, um, we're, we're still giving away Mother's Day cards. You yes. may not see it in your cart, Um but we're still handing those we're out. We're going to give them away till they're gone. With every purchase. And we got thousands and thousands and yeah. thousands of them. We so, want all the moms to be happy. So I see those going until at least the end of the week. So keep on buying. We'll keep on sending out those cards so you can keep your mothers happy. Yeah, definitely. And next week, we will be giving away with every purchase... Um, a, a new patch. Yes. For for Grind It Out. Yes, it's the actual, the Grind It Out um, basically logo, I guess you could say, like that you might have seen on Instagram and stuff like that. It's really cool. Which Mr. Thomas Dragonetti himself designed. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> it's, an, it's a cool skeleton hand holding a, yeah. a crazy hammer because hammer means power and grind it out work. to death yeah it's it, they're they're really rad so i can't wait to get my hands on one of those and speaking of grinding out we have a new one coming out right a new yes. mini doc every two weeks i believe we're going to be releasing new mini docs on 
people who are grinding it out in their everyday life and showing you how our coffee lives. That's the whole point of this this campaign. And uh, we got a brand new one with a guy named Ron Greico. Uh, he is a, a really, really cool dude. He owns a coffee shop, but it, he has a very compelling story of how he got it, there. It's a comeback story. Yeah, Everybody so, loves a comeback story. So be looking for that next week. Um, and I got something to say, actually. We just confirmed this week that Death Wish Coffee is going to be a part of the New York Empire State Tattoo Expo in July. Yeah, we're breaking out into the tattoo world. We know we have, we have a lot of tattooed fans. So, yeah, we uh, have a lot of tattooed friends, too. Yeah, uh, and we're tattooed. Yeah, and we're tattooed. So I've been down to this um, this expo a couple times. It's incredible. It's absolutely ginormous. They're, the artists come from all over the world Come that come down there. They're there's some really, really heavy hitters that are going to be there, and we're going to hopefully caffeinate everybody. Yeah, just make everybody's hand shake. <laughs> <laughs> so look for us down there in July. And that's all we have for you this week. Sorry, okay. that's it. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. This week, we had the honor and the privilege to talk to Richard Fortis. He is an incredible guitarist that has played with everybody from the Psychedelic Furs to Rihanna, and currently he is playing with Guns N' Roses. Who's Guns N' Roses, Jeff? <laughs> Are you a big fan of Guns N' Roses, Jeff? I am, and I'm even more of a fan because they got the band back together, basically. For a while there, it was a lot of different people kind of coming in and out, and uh, just last year, um, Slash came back, and uh, so did Duff, and now it's, you know, a lot of, like, the originals in there. And Richard's been in Guns N' Roses, actually, since 2002. So he's been in it for a very long time as well. 15 so, years, man. Yeah, and they are killing it. If you haven't checked out any of the new shows, go on over on YouTube and type in Guns N' Roses, like, 2016 or 2017. They, they're killing it live. They're probably better than they ever were before. Yeah. They're probably a little bit less drunk than they were yeah. back in the past. Watching uh, Richard and Slash just trade off riffs is so cool. And he was really cool to talk to and had some really cool stuff to say about, you know, not only being in the music business for so long, but just life in general. So uh, here's mugs up to Richard Fortas. Cheers. The Fueled by Death Guest. What got you started in music? Like what made you, I always love the story because everybody has one. What made you pick up the guitar? <clears throat> well, I actually started on violin. I started when I was about four or five years old. That's awesome. I'm a violinist too, actually. There you go. <laughs> um, great minds. Yeah. I, I, I think I didn't really I, when it was first offered to me. I, I, you know, at the at that age, you just sort of like, yeah, sure, I'll try anything, you know. And right. yeah, I was also playing the drums at that point, so. I sort of got into both of them at the same time, and it, it sort of filled two different roles. You know, I was uh, doing violin at school. I was studying drums with a drum teacher, a private teacher, and that sort of, re as my tastes started to lean more towards rock and roll and less towards classical, I then later gravitated towards the guitar probably around the age of 11 or 12. That's cool. They were, were always were your parents musicians? No, no, no. Well, my mother actually was into vocal music and played piano and sang with different choirs and things like that. But but my father actually worked for he was part owners of a of a company that made musical instruments. So they they made guitars and they made amplifiers and it, that exposed me to that world awesome. of, uh, you know, of uh, rock and roll. So I really became obsessed with that, with rock, probably around the age of seven or eight, and just, you know, fell head over heels in love with it and really obsessed over it for, uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny, I, I really spent every waking hour, it seemed like, immersing myself in music and music, or rock and rock and roll history, and uh, and classical as well, you know? That's cool, man. Um, I gotta ask, do you still play the violin? 
I do, and I uh, I also play cello. That's uh, awesome. Which I picked up later on. Actually, you've done and, a couple uh, recordings with cello, I believe. I I saw right. Sure, sure. Yeah. I've done I've done quite a few recordings with cello and violin. That's awesome. But I actually played cello live with uh, a few different projects with the Psychedelic Furs. Um, awesome. Which a lot of their early stuff has cello in it. So mm. I would I played. Uh, six string electric cello. Oh, um, so which, cool! Yeah, it was really cool, and uh, it's actually a MIDI cello. So I had the high E string and a low F. So you know, it goes lower than a cello and yeah, uh, higher than a violin actually. But it was really cool for using it electrically. I had it mounted on a stand so I could just walk up to it and and play. It was really cool. That's, uh, that's I also awesome. used it with uh, an electronic artist named BT. BT, yep. Yeah, when I toured with him, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. I uh, I actually um, play an electric violin myself, and it's a it's a five string. It's an NS design, and uh, so I have that low viola string on it, which is really cool. I get to when I perform live with it, I get to you know play play low notes and high notes on it. So uh, it's it it's great to be someone like in your line of work who's not just you know it, it's it's hard enough to master an instrument but it's really great to to kind of push that boundary and to you know you start like you said you started out playing violin so it's something that you kept in your wheelhouse and you have cello and you have you know all of these other different instruments in your wheelhouse and that just that just makes it i in my mind that makes it more fun as a musician yeah absolutely I mean, I'm I'm more of a hack on the cello and the violin. <laughs> it, it, honestly, like I, you know, that's not. I never feel as comfortable walking into a session with a violin or a cello. Right. Um. So, it, but it's it's definitely a lot of fun for me. And as a when I'm doing composing, when I'm doing film scoring, or you know, commercials and things like that, it's really great to have. I always add my own violin and cello parts <clears throat> in con in conjunction with samples and you know the sample the normal right orchestrating sample libraries just because it, it adds that even to have a few different live instruments really makes those come those parts come to life that's awesome and yeah so when did your uh career as a rock musician start to take off for you? Uh, I guess I was about 15 years old and I went to a left my my regular public school and went to a an arts school that was like a magnet school downtown where I grew up in St. Louis and I went to uh, this art school and started meeting like-minded uh, musicians and w which was a tremendous opportunity just to be around those people and have you know when you're that's the hardest thing when you're a kid is about getting into music is finding like-minded musicians yeah you know and that was a really cool thing about that school is that I was around a ton of different people that were into completely different things and it, it was also a great experience for me as far as expanding my horizons and getting into other types of music, you know, and, right. and it was a city school. So I was really at that, at an early age exposed to, you know, the parliament funkadelic stuff oh, and, yeah. um, you know, all the, all the funk stuff that was going on at, at that time and really, also, you know, the early hip hop stuff gave me a, a well rounded musical background. That's awesome. But I, I started playing with, I found some guys when I was about 14, 15, started in school, and we were into older music. We were into like, a, like the more of the art rock, uh -huh. yes, and Genesis and Pink Floyd, and more of the artier stuff, you know, Bowie. Right. Um, and then, and not so much the contemporary stuff, not like Poison and Def Leppard and... Right, and Guns N' Roses. <laughs> <clears throat> no, it was, it was actually before Guns N' Roses, but, uh, 
Um, but yeah, I, I just wasn't, it wasn't my thing. You know, I was into uh, uh, stuff like Sabbath and, you know, the older, st- like older rock classic stuff like the who and, yeah, yeah, you know, um, the kinks. And so we were, we were into that stuff as, w- as well as the typical musician school, uh, n- nerdy stuff like Ma Vishnu Orchestra and, um, what was going on in the whole, you know, jazz fusion period. Yeah. And being musos. And then I heard the clash and we all sort of naturally progressed from listening to that stuff into the clash and the beat and the damned and, uh, sex pistols and moans and all that, you know, and really at that point, it became about trying to pretend like we couldn't play our instruments, right. you know? So yeah. it was this weird dichotomy where you go from one extreme to the other, where, you know, it was with the art stuff and the jazz stuff, it's also masturbatory. And it, and then it going to the other extreme of just serving the song and really not trying to show your chops, but the opposite. Yeah. And I mean, you're 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 talking about a period of music, you know, like music had, like you said, like it had this huge shift at that point because, it, like, you know, it was going from this this ideal of you know um, performance and, uh, <coughs> and chops, I guess you could call it, you know, to like you said, like not playing your instrument right, and you're he, you're coming up in bands at this point, right? Like you're 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 in bands at this point. Yeah, I was I was in a band. Yeah, is is that so? Is that changing your like as you're as you're kind of forming bands and you're and you're playing? Is that changing your your actual style? A- absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because we were looking, I was listening to a lot of bands like The Police. It's what's interesting is that the group of guys I was playing with all we all sort of shifted. Like it was a natural shift to somehow go from you know this one extreme right. uh, to the other I, I, for whatever reason you know i don't know why that is but like you know bands like the police and you two were just coming out and it was that was like i don't know it just we all sort of gravitated that towards that direction and do you think it might have been like you you hit that rebellious age and then you just kind of end up getting into that like rebellious like fuck you, fuck the world, like really just thrashing and just like at that time in your life. And it it just happened to be at the same time that that music started to get popular too. Mm, Yeah, maybe. I mean, it was definitely that age, but, and it was definitely something new and exciting. But, you know, when also when you look at, when you look at Ma Vishnu Orchestra, you know, that, that was equally as rebellious. Oh, Totally. You know, they were that was a big fuck you to Miles. Yeah. You know? Oh totally. And and all those guys were like, you know, fuck you, we're gonna we're gonna This is prove jazz. ourselves and do <laughs> yeah, we're gonna make something completely unique. <laughs> yeah. And uh and but I guess I guess you're right. I guess it was sort of that was it was so niche at that time, especially where we were coming from, you know, in the Midwest. Right. It was like, wow, this is really exotic. Like, this is totally different than what we're hearing on the radio. And that was what was, I think, so attractive in and uh, to uh, attractive to our rebellious nature at that age. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I mean, it, kind of jumping ahead a little bit. I mean, you now, you know, you um, are known in your early career for your work that you did, you know, with like uh, Pale Divine and uh, Love Spit Love and Psychedelic Furs, like you had mentioned. Um, and then you shifted to Guns N' Roses, which we'll talk about. Um, but yeah, you I, also, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but yeah, and I kind of want to get into that because not only not only do you have that shift, but you also like you also touched upon earlier that you do a lot for um, soundtrack stuff, uh, movie, television, that kind of thing. Do you think like? kind of what you were just talking on with this music growing up in a musical shift like that and being open to all these these different types of music do you think that's why you continually put yourself out there for to to do these different types of projects because i mean what's cool about a guitarist like yourself is that you 
you are you can find you anywhere it seems like there the, your your span of recordings like spans all different types of genres and uh do you think that comes from your youth or is that something i, that I think that kinda... it definitely does come from yeah. my youth but it also comes from just a general love and obsession of music i mean that's really that i mean we started talking about earlier that really has just driven me and inspired me and i i love a challenge you know i love walking into a new form of music that i'm that i haven't really uh immerse myself in and uh and really exploring that you know if you look at my phone it's just or my music library it's just uh, such a wide ranging collection you yeah. know and <clears throat> i think what i'm really attracted to is anything i don't anything unexpected anything that is going to somehow inspire me you know, and that's not going to be anything that's formulaic in my mind. You know, I don't find anything appealing or interesting in a a band or an artist that I find formulaic. You know, and, and when I know what's going to come next, right. you know what I mean? Yeah, that's totally. why pop pop music is not really uh, attractive to me because of that. Yeah, because it follows a formula, and it's... not that I don't admire it, and, I, and there's definitely. Um, definitely a lot there and it's it's, it's almost just too not, easy it's like predictable almost it's pre- it, right it's like yeah it is it's not stimulating anymore you know I, I i've definitely felt that even like with physical activities like i just i just think of rock climbing and when i first started i was like i can't do this shit at all but that that made me like work that much harder to to get good at it like finding myself bad at things makes me just want to get good at it even more. Do you feel that way too? Yeah, absolutely. That's cool, man. Absolutely. Um, and then, and then once you've, <laughs> once you've conquered that wall, you know, you don't want to keep going back to it. You want to insp- You want to go to bigger, more challenging things. You know, totally. and that's what's going to inspire you. So uh, for me, you know, like I. I guess, uh, you know, when I would, I would always look for opportunities to do, like, I was always obsessed with country guitar playing. Yeah. I always, i not a huge fan of country music, per se, until later, mm-hmm. but I was always really intrigued by country guitar, because it's just so damn incredible. Yeah. You know, it's, these guys are just ridiculously talented players, and I... Uh, I was always very intrigued by that and started studying it. And so, you know, being able to do some country stuff was, uh, I think, is really uh, inspiring for me. And it, it, like I said, it's not uh, there. Actually, now there seems to be a lot more going on in that genre that I find it appealing, um, you know, with guys like Sturgill Simpson. Sturgill yeah. Simpson. <laughs> yeah, that you know, man. I think he's and, uh, he's incredible. Yeah, but it, it seems like it's sort of taken it. It's gone from you know the pendulum always swings, doesn't it? I mean, it's yeah. gone from this formulaic rock pop country hybrid that you hear on almost like hip hop beats in the background too. It's I, I, really oh, it's weird. so yeah, it's totally hip hop influenced. You know, it's just I don't know. I I don't. That I don't bro country. I don't find yeah right <laughs> much in there for me. But yeah. uh, you know, guys like Sturgill and I, I that's incredible. Yeah, he, uh, we had a guest earlier on a, a gentleman by the name of Rob Fenn, really great photographer, and he he called Sturgill Sturgill Simpson the 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 last Johnny Cash. Yeah, but I mean, it seems like there's more of that going on now. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely opened up a little bit more in that in that music genre, which is nice. Yeah. Um so speaking on your career even more, um you have gotten this incredible um <coughs> reputation, I guess you can call it, for being, you know, a gun for hire. Um and, you know, for people who want to, you know, want you on recordings, whether it's, you know, soundtracks or, or albums or stuff, or you know, live tours and performing. Do you do you gravitate to one or the other um, more? No, I no, I don't. I really enjoy both equally. Awesome. Um, and 
there was a time in my life where when I was living in New York and I was, you know, with the furs and with Love Spit Love and I was doing a lot of session work mm-hmm. and I was, you know, but that's when there was a lot of session work. Right, right, totally. Um, but I couldn't afford to go on the road. You know, I would get offers and it was like, ah, man, I, you know, unless it was something I really loved, right. I just, I couldn't justify it because financially I was making more money just doing sessions yeah. all the time. And, and I was booked. I mean, I was in my, as you get more and more booked, you get more and more expensive. Right. Yeah. And, Which is a good you thing. know, it was at a point where I just couldn't afford a tour. And then sort of the bottom fell out of that. Yeah. You know, slowly but surely. I actually moved to Los Angeles. And, you know, I had joined GNR. And, mm-hmm. um, was that your first tour was GNR? Or when did you, when did you first start touring? Oh, I started touring when I was 15. Yeah, oh, with cool. the bell, yeah. And the eyes and everything, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I had toured with, you know, I'd done some pop tours. I'd done tours with The Furs and with uh, Love Spit Love and um, some other bands. Is there a big I difference between, with, like, uh, your pop tours and your, your Guns and Guns and Roses tour? Um. Like, cause I know you've done like big production stuff. I know, like you, uh, a couple of years back, uh, toured with uh, Rihanna on a bunch of dates, and then, um, you know, obviously now you've been touring with uh, GNR for for a long time. Like, they both seem like huge productions. Is there is there any kind of difference in in that other than the music? Obvious. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously the music is, it's a different thing. Yeah. Though it's all it's always a learning experience. You know, there's always something you can learn from because you're always going to be working with great musicians you right know? yeah so but different types you know like a lot of the guys in the rihanna camp came out of the whole gospel chop scene you know yeah and so that was cool you know to play with guys like that um and you know you always you're gonna if your eyes are open your ears are open you're always gonna walk away a better musician and that's that's awesome i mean you know because you're right in that respect, not just in music, but in anything like you, you keep your eyes and ears open. You can learn pretty much doing, you know, where, whatever you're doing. And that's, that's a great outlook to have. Yeah. I mean, I, and really at the end of the day, I just, it's, it's pretty incredible to be able to make a living playing music. You know? And, and you get to do something that you obviously love deeply. Oh and yeah. That's, and that's, and, and that's awesome. You know, my father used to always say to me that he's like, yeah, you're, you're blessed because you're, you'd be doing this for free if you weren't getting paid for it, which is absolutely true. That's awesome. You know? <coughs> so, so let's go. You, you moved out to LA. Um, and, uh, well, I you, lived in New York most of my life. Right. And, um, then, and then you said you moved out to LA when you joined up with Guns N' Roses, right? Well, I, I actually had joined Guns N' Roses. I've been in the band for a few years. Oh, okay. Um, before I did move to LA. Um, and I know and you, I thought, Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. That's right. I thought I'd be able to, continue my com- I had a company in New York that was doing TV and film and commercial work. Oh, okay. And video games. And uh, I, I had a studio there and I thought, well, you know, I can do the same thing from LA and I had a partner in New York and figured, well, we'll keep that out open and I'll be able to work remotely and that didn't really work so well. Yeah. And uh yeah, I you sort of have to be there. But anyways, it uh I was only in L.A. for four or five years. That's not bad. Um, so you, you, you joined up with Guns N' Roses in, in 2001, correct, I believe? Uh, I think it was the end of 2001, beginning of 2002. 2002, around there. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference of uh, when you kind of came into the band to what the band is experiencing now, um, either tour-wise or, or, you know, at least uh, production-wise? Well, it's, it's morphed through several different incarnations since I've been in it. Right. Um, and some pretty big changes. When I came in, I was really drawn to it because originally it was Josh Freeze and Tommy Stinson yep. and Robin Fink and those and Buckethead. You know, not so I didn't really wasn't that familiar with Buckethead, but also Brain yeah. came in. And those were all guys that I'd worked with before and was really excited to play with. 
Like, That's cool. You know, I was a huge re- replacements fan. Yeah. Um, and obviously a big nails fan. Mm-hmm. Um, so working with those guys was, you know, no, that was really intriguing to me. That's and cool. and I was really, I wasn't that familiar with, I mean, obviously I knew Guns N' Roses, I knew uh, Appetite, and I knew all the big hits, but I, I never really owned a record, or it just wasn't my genre. Right, you were you were in a, almost a completely different genre at that time. Yeah. Was, that, was and, that a learning curve for you when you joined the band? No, no, because it makes total sense, because they were... Guns N' Roses really was separated from that L.A. hair metal scene, which yes. is who I sort of lumped them in with initially. Uh, but uh, you know, once you get into it, you realize it, it's much more akin to classic rock and uh, and and punk rock. Mm-hmm. And so it makes perfect sense that I would <laughs> relate to it. It, it sort of... It, yeah. Once I got into it, it's like it fit really well for me that's because right. that's my background. Right. You know, equal parts Black Flag and Rolling Stones. So. <laughs> it's the best. It's a, it's a, it's a great uh, combination. Um, so, so when you got into it, it was that, it was that one thing. And I mean, obviously now it's, it's morphed into, um, you know, the older members coming back and uh-huh. and doing and doing the tour that you did last year. Now you guys are, are you guys are just finished it up your tour. Or you guys are just about to go out on a tour, right? No, we just finished. Uh, we just finished another leg of Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Singapore, Thailand, Dubai. Wow! And uh, now we're off for a couple of months, oh, that's and nice. then and then we start up in Europe. And we'll be doing Europe and then the States and Canada again. That's great. And But when you're off from <coughs> Guns N' Roses, I can't imagine uh, you, Richard, are, are off from anything. You probably have uh, a projects going on right now, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I do have some things I'm working on. I'm working on uh, a couple of different movie projects and uh, <coughs> and hoping to... I'm also writing stuff. That's awesome. That is that. that I mean, is there anything... Is there anything out there in the business that uh, that you still want to try? I mean, you've you've been. It seems like you've been everywhere and, and done everything. And I know that's not the case, but I mean, are there is there any bands out there or any kind of t- types of music that you, you still haven't gotten a chance to do that you that you want to kind of check off your list? Uh, not not. Really, I don't really have a list. <laughs> good. That's a good. That's I, uh, a, good th- a good thing. It, it, you know, when I was in I, when I was in New York, I also did a lot of I did a lot of hip hop stuff. I mm-hmm. played. In a Zydeco band, I, like, oh, I've awesome. done a lot of different types of things. It's not so much a, a you know, there's nothing that I necessarily want to try, but I w- I have been sort of itching to do something more experimental and sort of less classic rock. Okay, and more towards the uh, you know the love spit love first stuff that I've done and mm-hmm. do something more in that indie type of direction. Oh, cool. Well, I, I, but I, I hope that but I have happens. nothing, I have nothing lined up. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I have faith in you that you'll put something together someday. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but you know, so, when I, when I, I find myself really being, when I listen to new music, I'm always listening to bands of that sort rather than, rock bands you know oh, okay cool cool so you're playing like tour after tour after tour and then even when you're home you're busy and i'm sure you have like family and everything so and i and i know you probably even have like bad days and like what keeps you fueled to like keep on going keep on like going through the tours keep on you know starting new projects keep on writing new songs what keeps you fueled man uh you know, really, honestly, right now, it's it, my life is primarily focused around my kids. That's awesome. Um, that's like really my first priority. That's awesome. There's 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 no better priority than 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 your children, you know. Yeah, I guess I guess it just sort of happens naturally. But um, that's yeah, that's definitely my. 
primary focus. That's awesome. Um, when uh, when you do get a free moment to yourself, what, what do you like to do for fun? Like other than play guitar, I mean, like, is, do you have it? Do, do you have any hobbies outside of being a kick-ass rock and roll star? <laughs> um, I really enjoy riding motorcycles. Awesome. Um, and then uh, you know, I not being a uh, not not spending time with drugs or alcohol anymore yeah <laughs> um i We're really have shifted my attention to to things like running and uh and being in the gym and that's stuff that i do every day mm -hmm. you know when i'm on the road when i'm and when i'm home yeah it's got to be it's got to be tough to to stay in shape especially when you're when you're touring so much and you know and uh, no it's not it, it, because that's the you know that's what i do that's during great the day you know so you got like a system down now when you're on the road to totally. To, that's totally. awesome. What, yeah, what, what's up, that like? How, wake, do you, how do you how do you I stay wake in up shape? and run? Yeah, and I run between you know six to ten miles generally. Wow. Um, when I'm on the road, and then I'll uh, come back to the hotel, eat breakfast, and then go to the gym. That's awesome. And that's that's the start of my day every day. That's a damn good way to start the day, man. That's awesome. And that and you know and. Death Wish coffee. Oh, <laughs> oh shucks. <laughs> it is. <laughs> That's usually before the running. Nice. Nice. <laughs> so is there anything uh, new that you're working on that you want to plug for, for, for our listeners? No, not really. I mean, the movie stuff doesn't, you know, it's not really pluggable yet. Right. And uh, um, now, I mean, really the focus of my life for the last year and a half has been GNR, yeah. which uh, is pretty exciting, really. You know, it's uh, this is of all the different incarnations, this one is uh, really the most inspirational to me, mm -hmm. um, and the most healthy. Yeah. Do you think that's what kept you so interested in uh, staying in Guns and Roses for so long? Is because it it just it constantly changes, so it stays stimulating. Um. Maybe I really enjoy. It, there's a sense of freedom and exploration, really, with with Axel when working with Axel, where he and now really much more with Duff and Slash. It's a, they really strive to do something better and different and keeping things fresh and it, it's really a concerted effort and that is really appealing to me that's awesome what was it yeah what was it like at the beginning and the onset of this this return of like slash and doff like like i mean obviously you know the media got the rumblings when it was when it was announced but i mean being in the band you guys must have like had stuff in place and like really started to put the work in was it like was it a whirlwind, or did it kind of like creep up and kind of just kind of happen? It sort of creeped up. Yeah, you know, and it sort of all happened very organically. We didn't have a bass player. You know, Tommy had left to go. Yep. To go do the Matt stuff, and uh, we didn't have another guitar player. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, like, "Well, we know a couple of guys." Yeah. <laughs> 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 and it just sort of it just sort of happened in that way. That's all, so that's that's great to hear that it you know it was just something that you know organically kind of just happened. And Duff and I knew each other. Um, I don't know. I don't know how much Slash was familiar with me or with Frank, but uh, it, you know we we all got together and sort of. Felt out, felt out how it would be, mm -hmm. and uh, how it was to play with each other, and it really, you know, some things click, some things don't, and uh, with the three of us, definitely clicked. I, I think we all agree it clicked instantly, and uh, and Frank maybe took a little bit. Uh, for them to get used to playing with him because mm. he's a different drummer than yep. Matt, who they'd been playing with. Um, but it really just 
seems to come together well. Yeah. And everybody's pretty psyched about it. Yeah, I as a as a fan of the band, um, seeing you guys perform all together for those first couple shows, um, it just looked like you'd been doing it for years. You know, it, it didn't it, it 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 seemed so natural. You know, for the at least especially like you said for the three of you, like it just seemed like it. Yeah, was the first couple fit. of shows, <laughs> what that it was. Yeah, everyone sort of feeling there. To, oh, totally, the way around. totally, but, totally. Uh, but, but I mean, it was now. Wasn't, now it's killer just really it just gets better every show that's awesome and that makes you excited to keep going out there and doing it and you said yeah uh, absolutely you said this summer you guys are going to europe and then you're and then you're doing the states after that right in the fall yeah that's yeah that's good, well, yeah that's exciting yeah it is exciting awesome man and then uh and then i think we go back to south america right after it's gonna be the next uh after this two months it's gonna be pretty full on for a while yeah um so there's not much time off so you've been everywhere i always love to ask this question um what's your favorite place to play like and it can be a country or a venue or, or whatever but do you have a favorite do you ever do you ever like think of a place and and or fondly? get or get pumped about like oh shit we're going there we're, oh, we're, i'm so yeah. psyched uh well i get excited about places like like Thailand, we were just in Bangkok, and it was the first time I'd ever played Bangkok, oh, and cool. I'd spent plenty of time in Thailand because I used to go there every year, mm-hmm. and it, it's my favorite place in the world. So to play Bangkok was a big deal for me, and it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Um, but you know, there's there's certain audiences that make that make it great. You mm-hmm. know, in South America, you can't beat the passion of those audiences i've heard that from many musicians that south america is just they're they're so rabid for music for live music. yeah yeah Yeah. brazil and uh and argentina man it's just it's just all of south america but it seems like those two places in particular are just so full-on and they have damn good coffee down there (laughs) yeah i hate that Uh, they do have good coffee. Yeah. That's awesome. Really, like, you know, Nicaragua, Colombia, and that's... We were just in uh, Medellin, mm-hmm. and uh, I I was telling you, I bought, bought a bunch of coffee there. That's awesome. But, uh, yeah, it, it, but <laughs> honestly, Death Wish really is right there with it, which was, uh, you know, you buy these... Yeah, you know, we we went to uh, the Juan Valdez. Oh, awesome! <laughs> uh, you know, which the high end Juan Valdez stuff was has always been one of the best coffees, and it really is incredibly smooth. And I, I told you when I got home, and I compared it with the uh, with the Death Wish beans, and it, it it was shocking how you guys just stuck up right against it. Uh, thanks, man. Yeah, that's yeah, uh, that's lot. some really, really high quality uh, fair trade organic Peruvian beans, and that's yeah. that's we take really good care of the roast too. I mean, we watch that ourselves, and we got some really great A roasters in house. So we're really we're really proud of our product, man. Thank you very much. Uh, for the yeah, you should be. You should be. Thank you very much, brother. Uh, it's it was it, like I said, it was shocking to me because when you first see the skull and crossbones, you're like, yeah, this is sort of right. you know the strongest coffee. Yeah, this is sort of gimmicky. Yeah, but but uh, man, it, incredibly smooth. Really, awesome. really impressive. Thanks, you. Truly honored, and thank you very much for for joining us on the podcast, man. Really. Really appreciate that, you know, and uh, really big fan of you and a big fan of well, your work. And I'm a big fan much. of yours, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to hopefully keep you caffeinated um, through your next couple tours. And uh, awesome. Yeah. And uh, we wish you the best of luck with everything that you're doing, man. It's you, you know, it's it's inspirational to talk to someone who not only is good at what they do, but who genuinely loves what they do. And I, I like I like. You know, I like a dude who likes a challenge. You yeah. know, I definitely, I definitely can relate to that. It's like, ah, oh, shit, I don't, I don't know how that works. Let's, let's fucking figure it out. Yeah, so, yeah definitely right. respect, man. Yeah. Thank you very much. This has been Fueled by Deathcast, a Death Wish Coffee Company podcast production. Thanks for listening. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is Brock. Oh, yeah, the Death Wish stuff? Yeah, it's done now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Big check, too. They said a big old check's coming, so <laughs> I'll get you that money, Tito. You just uh, you just hold off on your guys for me, okay? Oh, they're already at the house. <laughs> oh, shit. I'll be down.